coming up on this week's episode of the Retro Hour podcast, how you can experience your N64 games in glorious HD. Play Mario on your Amiga. And we get the lowdown on the Commodore VIC-20 from Neil Harris, one of the original launch team. Welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 177, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. And me, Ravi Abbott. And welcome to this week's show. Now, we are going to be talking about a system that even though, you know, we've talked about Commodore a lot on this podcast. Um, you know, the Amiga, we've talked about a lot, the Commodore 64 as well. But there is really one machine by Commodore that was, you know, their first real big hit, I guess. It was the first machine to reach one million units sold. And that was the Commodore VIC-20. Yes, yes, the VIC-20 is mentioned by a lot of our guests, but we really haven't done much focusing on it, so I think this is going to be a really good app. Now, we remember we had Scott Adams on talking about those text adventures that he yeah, made on the VIC-20, yeah. and he's a big fan of that machine. I mean, I think at one stage, the entire top five of the VIC-20 sales chart, even though it was a graphical system, were those Scott Adams adventure games. And do you remember William, William Shatner, Captain Kirk, was in the TV adverts for yeah, it as well? Yeah. So this week, we are going to be joined by um, a really interesting guy called Neil Harris, who was not only one of the uh, Commodore VIC-20 launch team. But after that, he followed the Tremils to Atari and was one of the um, launch guys on the ST as well. So a lot of stuff that we're going to cram into the interview with him that will be coming up on the show in around 15 minutes from now. Now, of course, summer is not showing any signs of slowing down. <laughs> Another trip away next weekend. Um, I was in Poland a couple of weeks ago for uh, Pixel Heaven. Next week, me and you are heading off to Retro Spill Messen. Yeah, Norway, for our Scandinavian crew. It's going to be awesome, this is. Now, this is happening uh, next weekend on the 22nd to the 23rd of June. In um, <laughs> Someone did email us with the correct pronunciation because we completely mangled this, but Sandifjord in Norway. Okay. Um, or Sand- yeah, I'll, I'll, put the, I'll put the link in the show notes so you'll find it there. But there is so much happening as well. Now, this is a real family event, celebrating video games, geek culture, consoles, comics, uh, TV, but games are the main focus of it as well. And we're going to be there hosting a few panels, and we've got a few mates who are going to be there too, um, who you'll be familiar with. Uh, Daniel Ibbotson, Slopes Game Room. Oh, yes. He's going to be there. David Wise of Rare fame. We're actually going to be doing a little uh, panel about Rare, aren't we, when we're there? Yeah, yeah. And uh, we've got quite a few from the Conkers team. There's Kev Bayliss there as well. So the guys have really kind of sorted us out with amazing guests for this. Thank you so much, Retro Spill Messing dudes. Yeah, and if you can't uh, make it out there, obviously we'll be recording them to put them out in the podcast in uh, in future episodes as well. And there's some amazing gaming tournaments that are going to be happening. They're going to be having the Neo Geo World Tour Season 2, where you could qualify for a global final in King of Fighters 98. Now, that was a game, I think, me and you were at like some event years ago, and I sat down on a Neo Geo and we were playing it. Someone yeah. actually sent me a video randomly, like someone was behind me filming it, so my awful performance on it, but <laughs> I think I'm maybe have to try and do a bit better on that. And also, the Classic Tetris World Championship is going to be there too. Oh, awesome. So if you're a bit dexterous on your Game Boy back in the day, then uh, tickets are available for it now. It's going to be happening next weekend in Norway. I'll, of course, put a link in our show notes at theretrohour.com where you can buy your tickets from. Now, before we talk about the VIC-20, let's just give a big thank you to our supporters. Now, the Retro Hour podcast comes out every single Friday. You know, every week we bring you the Retro Gaming News and an incredible guest as well. But the only reason that we can do this is thanks to your support. It really is a show donations that allow us to keep doing this show week in, week out, cover our expenses, hosting. I mean, it's not cheap doing a podcast every week, so we really do appreciate that, guys. And it means, you know, we don't have to pay for it out of our own pocket completely. So that's massive, massive, massive help. Now, if you'd like to make a donation, you can do it via PayPal on our website at theretrohour.com. And for doing that, you will find your place in the most prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming, the Retro Hour Hall of Fame. Like this week, Tim Dalman. Simulant Systems Limited, Darren Coles, and Nicholas Antrobus, who all made donations into the running of the show. And if you'd like to do the same, all you've got to do is nip onto our website, click on the Support Us section at the top on the nav bar at theretrohour.com. Now, of course, recently, it's been all about these mini consoles, hasn't it? It has. I think it's getting to the point that people are just trying to make money now, and they're not really. You're right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, what makes you think that, really? <laughs> Looking at Sega's latest announcement. Now, we all know that the, the Mega Drive Mini is coming um, in September this year. And interestingly, um, Sega released a picture and did a little live stream of uh, a couple of little expansions that you might want to get for your Mega Drive Mini. And these will cost about $37. It turns out that you can now recreate the infamous, I think it was nicknamed the Tower of Power back in the day. And that was having um, essentially all your Mega Drive slots 
filled with accessories. So they've released a picture showing a mini Mega CD and a mini 32X with a Sonic the Hedgehog Japanese release cartridge in the top. Yeah, it's interesting because these look like just compete pieces of plastic. Yeah. They're not, they're not going to be functional at all, are they? No, they're not. No. These are purely for decoration. Um, It'd be cool if they had, you know, the GameCube CDs, if you could put that in the Mega CD. Oh, the <laughs> little tiny ones, that would be so good. If it ran GameCube games, that yeah. would be that would, a, a, few, a few scratched heads at that point, I think. Um, but, I mean, the Mega Drive Mini is coming. I think it is for people that would want to recreate that and it looks nostalgic too. I always thought the 32X looked ugly as sin anyway. Like, yeah. a, like a nuclear yeah. explosion on top of your Mega Drive. But, I mean, you do make a good point there, and some people have been saying this. What they should do is, these are purely for decoration, but they should have bundled these. Maybe you buy it and it plugs in the USB port, and it actually does have maybe the entire um, 32X catalogue preloaded yeah, on it or something. Yeah, because I know there are consoles that are trying to do that, like yeah. that Polymega and stuff. They're all trying to emulate 32X uh, and Sega CD stuff, so it would make sense, but then, you know, it requires research. This is a fast book, isn't it? Yeah. Like, I think, Sega, you should stop making mini consoles and make a biggie or like i thought sonic mania was a really good way of going forward and i think this dropping out games is good and getting a console but this is just like christmas decorations isn't it really? <laughs> well i think we, we've talked before we're not really the the target demographic for no, these no, mini consoles yeah. it, it's people that you know might be shopping in asda but then and who's think, gonna know about a mega cd and a 32x it's not a geek yeah, you know, they, they weren't that mainstream back in the Granny's day. Granny's not yeah. going to go in there and go, oh, the old 32X, I remember that. You know? It might be people like Joe, I think. He's, yeah, he's probably maybe, the target yeah, audience for yeah. this, isn't he? Maybe he wants it to look cool on the shelf. But, I mean, they have actually announced the, the final 12 games as well okay. for the Mega Drive Mini. You know, last week we were saying, oh, you know, there's no columns on there. Oh, the, Columns is obviously one of the yeah, games they've yeah. announced. Snow Bros as well they've added. Uh, Virtua Fighter 2 is in there too. Dynamite Heady, uh, Strider, Road Rash 2 as well. Oh, good. Which yes, I think yes. is definitely a, a worthwhile addition. Rash. Yeah, two was always my favourite as well of the series. I think that so. Um, music. Yeah, and it, it does take it up to forty-two games on the system now as well. Okay. So the full lineup is out there, and uh, I think actually it's going to be quite a nice little um, little package for Mega Drive fans who you know just want either that portable system that can take around a friend's house or people that haven't played a Mega Drive game for 20, 30 years. Just so. imagine it's going to be like really light and plastic and cheap, and people are going to be like, "Oh, I've knocked over my tower. Wait a sec, guys!" And then they'll be restacking it, and then their mates will be kicking it over for a lot. They should make it like the original and have three power packs for it as well, but just yeah, you know, yeah, serve no function it. at all. So, Just uh, drain your house. <laughs> Although, speaking of which, I did get um, a power supply off, um, off, off some website. I can't remember which one it was recently. For my original 32X... Um, Mega CD and Mega Drive that just plugs into one wall socket. Oh, wow. So um, you don't need all those ridiculously oversized plugs anymore, which is quite cool. If anyone wants to know where I got that from, just drop me a tweet um, at Retro UK and I will link you up. Now, of course, we did kind of touch on this last week. I mean, the news came a little bit late for us to get into it last week, but it looks like Apple might be killing off iTunes. Ooh. So iTunes and Apple. Apple are the company that introduced podcasting and Steve Jobs when he did his introduction of podcasting, he, he played a podcast with lots of swearing on it. That was quite I funny when he did that, yeah. <laughs> but then he actually said that podcasting is always going to be free, which I think is a really good thing because, yep. you know, they, they could have commercialised it and I think that would have killed it straight away. But iTunes itself has been broken for many years. The charts have been inaccurate. Um, Except when we're number one. Yeah. So. <laughs> There's there have been many reports of services of people manipulating the charts, yeah. uh, manipulating reviews. I, I remember a while ago they were, they were talking about you could just pay people in Australia and just totally manipulate the whole iTunes charts. It's absolutely crazy. So I'm kind of glad that they're they're changing it into a separate entity and putting so much research into it. What I find about iTunes is, I mean, I've used it since, you know, pretty much its inception, really. I remember when I got my first iPod, um, I used it on Windows, and that was before iTunes came out on Windows, and you had to use um, Music Match Jukebox. I don't know if you remember that thing. That was horrible software. No, I, I used <laughs> Sony Net MD. Oh, oh mini discs. Yeah, okay. oh, God, that was bad. <laughs> then iTunes came along, and, I mean, it was cool to be able to... Because you know, my girlfriend at the time actually had um, one of the old iMacs, and then I got an iMac G3. Yeah. Um, you know, on the, like, the Snow White ones, not the ones that look like a toilet seat. And then I could actually use my iPod on, my, on a Mac using iTunes. And iTunes has always been better, I think, on a Mac than it has been on Windows. But over the last few years, 
it's just turned into this bloated mess. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of real player. When real player yeah. started, it was nice and lightweight, and by the end of it, it was this chugging beast. <laughs> Duke, real, real jukebox or something, yeah, yeah. didn't it? With so many windows and options. That yeah. is a good comparison. I mean, it's got, you know, people have said that it's got like 15 to 18-year-old code still in there that it's all yeah. kind of piled on top of. And, you know, every time you seem to get a new update for iTunes, it takes longer and longer to load. So... It turns out they are retiring it, and what they're going to do is, and I mean, if you listen to our show, for example, on your phone, you'll already have this, because on um, iOS or on iPhone, um, podcast has been a separate app for, you know, a good few years now anyway. So all they're going to do really is um, break them out onto desktop the same, so on your Mac or Windows, you'll have um, you'll have music in Apple Music, you'll have um, Apple Podcasts. So the the breaking one is separate. I noticed that. So even our link this week to play in iTunes off our website, you clicked on that and it said, Instead of play on iTunes, it was like play on Google Podcasts, and they'd already changed some of the setup. So I don't think much is going to change other than a bit of a rebranding and yeah. a separation of uh, the elements. Yeah, and it gives them a chance to kind of reboot it and you not have all this old legacy code. and Yeah, and stuff like video. Like, who is buying videos <laughs> on iTunes? You know what I mean? That, nobody. It's like... I think I did buy... Um, what was that Jim Carrey movie when he tries to forget his ex-girlfriend? Oh, I can't remember. Eternal Sunshine of the oh, Spot- Spotless Mind. That's it. Yeah, yeah. I bought that for my, um, <laughs> I think my iPod 5th gen that could play video to watch it on the screen on the plane when I went on holiday. Well, there's <laughs> one good thing that comes out of all of it, and that's that we're not going to get U2 songs on everything. <laughs> <laughs> what, you mean you didn't enjoy the free album? That got no, four, I was four, like, four, three, three how, how did U2 get on my system? <laughs> Delete them. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Rest in peace, iTunes. I mean, to be fair, iTunes, it was, you know, it's going it's to have its place in history as being... You know, a, a piece of software that did change the world. Yeah, so, like, they were even talking on other podcasts about how the original podcast used to come out. Mm. People would torrent them. Yeah. And they'd say, please seed so my podcast can get more <laughs> listeners. And it's like, what? And you think of trying to buy music before iTunes came along. I mean, there were certain websites you could go to to get MP3s, but yeah. really I went from, like, you know, Napster, you know, the, the dodgy side of it, straight to iTunes, and it became the first way of being able to, you know, affordably and easily download MP3s. Well, I just like that CD ripping thing where the, they, they had the CD and it would do the tracks and the cover art. And yeah. Even if it was a dodgy CD, iTunes would still do it back then. It wouldn't you know? mind. Yeah, the CDDA um, catalogue, get it off yeah. there. Um, so, I mean, iTunes will have a place in history as being, you know, the, the piece of software that I think did legalise and make music, you know, portable music and digital music affordable and accessible to the general public. So, Well, it, for helped, that. it helped get it into people's pockets when before it was a blooming effort to get it into your pocket, wasn't it? And there was a lot of resistance back in the day. I mean, you remember yeah. a lot of bands didn't want to be on there, did they? They still want to sell their uh, their CDs in our price for 18 quid. So, uh, I mean, you know, iTunes did do a lot to... And, uh, and creative yeah. audio player ruled the market. <laughs> did, you had one of those, didn't you, yeah, back in the yeah, day? Yeah, huge. Yeah. Like a lunchbox. <laughs> I had a, one of the really early MP3 players. I did a video on it, actually, and I think it held like something like a, a, a 16 megabyte internal memory. So you could fit like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, like 20 songs in there at like 94 90s. 64 kilobits. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah they weren't very good quality. So, uh, I mean, we, we take the makeup of iTunes, but I think it, it did do a lot, you know, to, to bring the world into the 21st century. Totally. So rest in peace, iTunes. Tunes. And of course, you can still get the Retro Hour podcast from the new Apple's podcast app. So we'll uh, we'll put links on our website. Of course, you won't miss us. Now, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about Mario on the Commodore sixty four. Yeah, yeah, which is uh, awesome because I actually had a go on it at, yeah. at Swag, and it is as good as the original. Yeah, you know, uh, there's no lag, no difference. It's fantastic. And then Nintendo came along, as you'd expect, and they made them take the link down, but you, know, you can find it's it. Out you know, there. It's Exactly. It's on FTP servers and stuff. Well, after that, what about Mario on your Amiga? Oh, I've always wanted Mario on my Amiga, yes. And uh, I, I, I remember Sonic on the Amiga. That didn't uh, run that well, did it? Well, there was a version that they did in Amos that kind of ran all right, and then there was a demo version, and then the project died. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. So I remember like, seeing like to see this. I remember seeing a rolling demo of Sonic. You couldn't play it; you could just kind of watch it. I, I had a suspicion it was more like just an animation someone had made. There was a cool Sonic demo that they did where Sonic ran across the bottom of the thing, and I think you could do left or right on him. Right, and okay, that was about it. Yeah, <laughs> but, but one of the scene groups. Well, there's this YouTube channel um, at the moment which um, they've actually put out a little video there that. Looks like it could be a pretty good port of Mario um, that runs on the Amiga 500. Awesome. Now, I, I always thought it was a very capable system of doing it, you know, particularly seeing that it's kind of a NES game. 
I, I actually think that Sonic is, you know, in terms of hardware, probably a lot more demanding than Mario was. Oh, yeah, because yeah. you've got the parallax, so many layers and stuff. Mario's a lot more simple. And the speed as well. Yeah. Well, there is a YouTube channel, um, a guy called Magnus T, and it appears to be showing um, a very, very good port of Mario um, running on the Amiga. And, you know, it looks so smooth. The graphics look brilliant on there as well. And it looks like it could be a really playable conversion. Now, obviously, after all of the you know, Nintendo takedown and stuff, and they, they seem really on that at the moment. Nintendo are, like, protecting their IPs. I bet they're trailers. hiring people to actually go out and look at these projects. Yeah. They, they must be, otherwise, yeah. how are they going to find out about them? Uh, but it turns out they're actually going to be <laughs> kind of keeping this game, um, you know, the engine and the style and everything, but probably, they said, um, one of the guys has commented on an article here, um, they're saying that it probably won't end up being a Mario game. They'll probably change it or tweak it a bit so it hasn't got the Mario name in there or the Mario. character. Mario. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, like Gianna Sisters was back yeah, in the day, yeah, I guess. Yeah. But even that didn't stop Nintendo taking it down back then. So, uh, I mean, if it does come out there, like we all say about these uh, kind of Nintendo rip-offs and clones and copies, get them while you can because yeah. generally they're not long. Good luck. Very long. Well, speaking of which, actually, it might be good to get into this one, actually, because um, the N64, which, you know, I'd probably rank up there. I love my Nintendo Switch, but... The N64 in terms of hardware and the timing of it has always been probably the Nintendo console that I've been most fascinated by. Yeah, and I think that the kind of fun multiplayer sit-down vibe that you have with the N64, there's no other one like it. Even with the Switch and stuff now, nothing beats getting around with your mates playing Goldeneye. Yeah, and it, yeah. And it really was. I mean, the, the first system I remember being made specifically for, cause, I mean, it had the four controller ports on the front as well, yeah. didn't it? So it really encouraged that multiplayer um, couch gaming. But you know, today, if you hook Everything up... Everything else needed multi-taps, didn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or them dodgy cartridges that you put in with extra... Yeah. Or serial adapters and that kind of thing. Uh, but today, if you try and play your N- N64 on a modern TV... It generally looks like a blurred mush. It does look like a blurred mush. And also all the emulators, um, for the, even if you've got a really high-powered PC, stuff like GoldenEye will still never work properly. And that really sucks. Like Mario 64, beautiful. That's yeah. been emulated so well. But really, you know, amazing titles just don't work sometimes. And it's really disappointing when you're like, right, I'm going to get on this N64 vibe. And then, oh, GoldenEye's slow. Great. <laughs> yeah, you're right. And the thing about the N64 is it was actually a pretty complex system. I mean, yeah. back then I remember all the hype that it was essentially a Silicon Graphics workstation shrunk down into a little console. And that's kind of, like you said, emulation. The, the struggle to make good emulators that run everything smoothly. And that's what I think, because like Mario 64 was probably one of the earlier titles. Later on, they probably doing lots of techniques and tricks that just the emulators can't do. And even modding your um, original N64 to um, output over HDMI, you know, there are people that have done that, but it's quite an expensive mod. And, I mean, you know, we, we're going to link up in our show notes to an article on Nintendo Life, and this guy in the comments actually mentions that, you know, he, he recently sold a HDMI modded N64 for over £400. And so. there was a lot of blur as well. People forget that. So even when you had the HDMI modded version, yeah. <laughs> you'd still get the blur on top of that, which uh, can really confuse things. Yeah, and it, yeah, it's not nice to look at on a modern TV. Well, there is a solution coming up now and it's by Hyperkin now oh, this is going to be good because Hyperkin are on it yeah like, we, we've yeah. covered them in the past before they do very good hardware uh, modern controllers for classic systems too and they're going to be um, revealing their next entry at E3 that's actually going on this week so they're going to be showing that over at E3 this week it's called the Ultra Retron now this is an N64 clone that plays original carts and outputs over HDMI. And it does have four controller ports on there as well, compatible with the original N64 pads. And um, they're even shipping it with their own take on the the old-school three-prong controller that I know is a bit of a divisive controller. I think you either love it or you hate it. Yeah, yeah, it was a divisive one, but also it was built to function with those games. So yeah. I, this is awesome. I, I'm going to get one of these looks fantastic you know depending on the price i'm sure hyperkin are going to do a good job of this yeah and i'd love to see the final output like um what it kind of looks like they've got a little video here and it really doesn't it's still got a little bit of that blur they i don't know if you can add anti-aliasing effects over it or something that might be interesting but 
it does look good and GoldenEye does run smooth. <laughs> well, some people in the comments are saying they've spotted a couple of little glitches in here. Like, you know, certain bits of like uh, Mario 64 don't quite look right like they should on the original. So yeah. there might still be, I mean, you know, it's I not I think released there'll be yet. a lot of tweaking to do with this. Yeah. Maybe even updates over the internet later on or something because it's such a complex thing to uh, emulate. That's the thing. And, and if there is any system that really does warrant, you know, like a recreation or a modern iteration of it, I think the N64 is one that really did oh, need it. Cause, you know, definitely. Yeah. needed it yeah so and you can play original carts as well which is pretty cool or an everdrive i imagine i'm working right golden eye well. session round dance <laughs> <laughs> I, I love playing golden eye as well but i'm terrible at it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember on christmas when we around joe's house playing it um might have been like you know the the, the seven cans of uh cause light i had before we and played the it. Uh, component input maybe <laughs> yeah, rf i think joe RF, had, yeah, so. yeah, yeah. He, he's a target customer for this come on joe yeah. hdmi so if you want to check that out, I mean, they are going to be showing it at E3 and we'll link up to the video and everything else we've talked about this week in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Right then, time to go really old school, back to the early 80s and talk about the Commodore VIC-20. You're listening to the Retro Hour podcast and this week we're going to be talking about a system that, you know, quite scandalous really that we haven't really done a proper episode about one of the most famous computers that came out. Uh, back in the early 80s, and actually the first machine to sell a million um, units actually back then. We're going to be talking about the Commodore VIC-20, and we're joined by one of the original launch team from the VIC-20, Neil Harris. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Great to be here. Now, just talking about, you know, your personal history, I mean, do you remember what kind of first got you into computers? Well, I fell in love with computers, uh, as many people who are listening to this probably did as a teenager, but the world was a very different place back in the dark ages when I was a teenager. Uh, in my junior high school in seventh grade, we had a uh, half a semester class in computers, and there was a computer teletype, uh, which is like a giant typewriter on a stand that was uh, had a modem that connected it to the one computer that the school system had it was in a, an air-conditioned room downtown. And the teacher would occasionally take it out from a, a locked crate and show it to us, and I just had to get my hands on it. And it was several years later in my next school in high school uh, where I discovered that there was a, a teletype that was uh, less under lock and key and more available to the students. And there were older students who had some experience with the computer that were willing to teach us how to program it. And that's when I learned to program in BASIC on an HP 2000 series mini computer that the school district of Philadelphia uh, operated downtown. And I spent uh, pretty much every spare minute, uh, instead of chasing women like uh, most of my compatriots were doing, uh, I was busy writing basic code and becoming a pretty proficient basic programmer. Well, at what point did you get a machine in your actual home then? Many, many years later, I would have killed to have even, it was really tough back then because at summertime, you'd had no access to the computer because the school was closed. So I went to work in the mid mid 70s as a programmer writing accounting software for mini computers. Uh, and in, uh, the first time I had a computer at home is after I went to work for Commodore, probably in the beginning of 1981. And what machine was it that you got at home then? Was it a Commodore machine? It was a Commodore PET. Yeah. So I had actually worked for Commodore in 1978 uh, when Commodore opened a computer store in Philadelphia called Mr. Calculator. It was actually 90% calculators and 10% computers, but computers were our big seller. And they needed people that understood them and could speak to uh, regular people who weren't necessarily technical. And I got the job and did that for a few, about six months. Well, how did you eventually get to, to working for Commodore on the, the VIC-20 team? And what did you kind of know about the VIC-20 before you joined? Well, so for several years in the late 70s, I worked either in programmer, programming jobs, writing more accounting software, or working in computer stores. And I worked in three different computer stores during that era. So I'd had hand, hands-on experience with not only the Commodore PET, but with the Apple II, the TRS-80 from Radio Shack, and the Atari 400 and 800 computers. Um, and uh, in January of 1981, my mother called and said that she heard on the radio that Commodore had moved to the Philadelphia suburbs from California and uh, was holding an open house for job seekers and that might be interesting to me. And I got very, very excited because I had read in one of the computer magazines 
that Commodore was getting ready to launch a color home computer for $595. And I thought that would really take the market by storm. Uh, so I showed up at the open house and I talked to the nice human resources lady and said, hi, I've worked with Commodore Pets as a programmer. I'm a good programmer. I'm a writer. I've written for several computer magazines. And oh, by the way, I heard about this new color computer and I'd love to learn more while I'm here. Is there somebody I can talk to? And she got, as I was talking to her, her eyes got bigger and bigger because this was not the kind of background that people had in those days. <laughs> you, you couldn't really find people that had been hands-on. It was, uh, uh, the, the computers weren't widespread like they are today. So she immediately walked me over to Michael Tomchek who I found out was the product manager for the VIC-20 computer. And uh, Mike interviewed me and pretty much hired me on the spot. So what were kind of Commodore's market aims with the VIC? Uh, the market aims were uh, basically put a computer in every house. It was, uh, it was all about uh, being very low cost and providing a reasonable level of performance. Uh, I mean, basically, it worked like a Commodore PET but it was uh, very, very affordable. I mean, Jack Trammell, who was the founder and CEO of Commodore, always said, uh, we build computers for the masses, not the classes. And at that time, an Apple II computer would cost about $2,000 plus disk drive and monitor and things like that. So it was out of the reach of most households at that point. I mean, again, we're talking about late 70s, early 80s, where... Uh, uh, inflation hadn't really kicked in the way it did later. So that was probably the equivalent of a $5,000 computer system today. And we were offering a, a comparable level of performance, more or less with the VIC-20, maybe a little, a little sacrifice of performance because we had less memory and, le and smaller screen real estate, but uh, comparable ease of use and a much, much, much lower price point. So we thought, we thought as part of the VIC-20 marketing team that we really had an opportunity to you know, basically what we used to say is make the world safe for computers, make it make it so that we could uh, get computers in the hands of people that uh, didn't necessarily have the money, but had the kind of interest that we thought people would have. Well, what was it like working for Commodore at the time? Because it was kind of just after the PET and before the huge explosion of the C64. Uh, well, we were part of the huge explosion. We were maybe the first stage of a rocket that really took off and the 64 was the second stage that boosted it into orbit. But um, the Commodore was very tiny at the time. There were probably 50 people working for Commodore US. Probably half of those people were at uh, MOS Technology, the chip making company that was based in suburban Philadelphia, which is why Commodore moved the rest of their operation to the East Coast of America. Um, so it was a very small organization and the resources all went to the PET team. So there was a PET software team and the PET guys were pretty arrogant and there were sales people in the rest of the country but the pet guys basically shrugged off the VIC-20 as a toy. They said the VIC-20 will be something that we give away free when we sell a real computer to people. Wow. And uh, you know, a year or two later, those guys were st stuck in a corner somewhere and we had really taken over the whole company. Well, you mentioned Jack Tramiel there, and uh, you know we've, we've all read a lot of stories about Jack. And uh, did you have much to do with him? And well, how did Commodore employees uh, you know, view him at the time? We've all you know, heard about the Jack attacks and stuff like that. I mean, how did you find him? Well, so I had heard about Jack long before I joined the company, since I did work for the Commodore computer store. And I worked for a small mail order company in, the inter in between years as well, uh, selling Commodore pets and various software and peripherals. And... Uh, the owner of that mail order company knew, uh, had met Jack and spoken with him and basically uh, told tales of terror about uh, Jack being uh, so temperamental and frightening. And so I had uh, a vivid picture of Jack in my mind and he was somebody that I was, uh, you know, I was young and inexperienced and I didn't really want to face the wrath of, a, of uh, somebody like that. I was also told that that. Commodore, that because Jack was so temperamental, you could expect to work for as much as a year would be a lot at a company like that, that he went around firing people and, uh, you know, yelling and screaming and pounding on the desk and one mistake and you were out. So I was determined to last at least a year. That was my, uh, my bar for success and uh, try not to have my head chopped off along the way. Once I met Jack, I found a much more nuanced version of the person. Um, 
he was very tough boss and he would yell at you if you deserve to be yelled at. But the fact of the matter was that as long as you were straight up with him and you tried your best and you told him the truth and you didn't try to give him a lot of BS, uh, you would do just fine. And uh, I have to say, I worked for Jack for about eight years between Commodore and Atari. Um, he wasn't always around. He was a world traveler. But when he was around, uh, you could have a conversation with him, ask him for his input, give him uh, your opinion on whatever he needed your opinion on. And uh, he was a great guy to work for. And he was very fair. Um, but really, heaven help you if you tried to make stuff up uh, or if he didn't think that you were thinking through what you were doing. He didn't like people who were robots. He wanted you to think for yourself. Did you ever witness any Jack attacks? I did. Probably the best Jack attack was uh, uh, in my second year at Commodore. We had moved out of the original facility where we were scattered among three or four small offices. And we moved into uh, a town called Devon, Pennsylvania, which is just south of where we started out and just north of where we ended up. And uh, that office was set up in, uh, in a modular fashion where you had lots of cubicles and things. And there was a big conference room right in the middle of the office. So the office was a big rectangle with a squared off uh, conference room in the middle. And the walls in the conference room only went up about seven feet and the ceilings were probably eight or 10 feet high. Uh, so it wasn't exactly a private accommodation. And uh, I'm not sure what the subject was at this point. It's a long time ago, but uh, one of our uh, software directors, uh, who was a very large guy, he was a, had played uh, American football as a center in college, and the center is usually one of the biggest guys on the team. So he was not a small guy, and Jack was not a big guy. Jack was probably um, maybe five five, um, you know, little European guy, and Jack was just ripping the guy into one. Uh, I'm not sure what the issue was, but there was pounding on the table and screaming. And we all expected he was he was done from uh, being an employee of the company. But uh, he just took a bit of a beating and went back about his business and was still employed there a couple of years later. So um, but it was uh, I, I have to say that the entire office was basically gathered around listening in on that because it was a, a pretty memorable occasion. So who were the kind of target? for the VIC-20? Was it kids, educational, or was it kind of game players? Well, it depends on uh, whether you believe what we were telling people in marketing or what we really thought was going to happen. So uh, what we knew would happen was that a lot of people would play games because it was a terrific game machine and uh, uh, had many capabilities that would allow us to create great games for it. Um, but we also knew that it was unlikely that mom was going to allow the dad and the kids to buy a game machine uh, that was more expensive than, say, an Atari VCS or something that was a dedicated game machine without a strong justification. We really marketed it as much more of an educational machine. And if you looked at Commodore's print advertising and TV commercials, it really focused hard on how much it would educate your kid. And realistically, so, you know, there was some fraction of the audience that would uh, learn computers from it, uh, probably a smaller fraction that would learn uh, schoolwork from it because the the amount of educational software was really minimal and frankly most people didn't buy it even that was out there uh, what's what sold were the games so the educational concept was the hook to get it past the gateway the guardian of the household which was usually mom and uh, uh, and then when people got at home they would have fun with it they would learn to program or they would uh, you know buy games and play a lot of games that's one thing about the, you know, the 8-bit systems of that era that they, when you turn them on, you dropped straight into basic. So, I mean, really, they, they did encourage the user to learn programming, which, you know, is something that kind of obviously went away later on. Well, it went away later on once there was uh, a giant variety of software. I mean, it, it, again, it reminded me of 10 years earlier when I first learned computers. And, you know, you basically had a computer terminal and basic. And that's what you did. You could load programs that somebody else wrote, but there weren't that many of them and they weren't that great. And it was the same thing in the early days of home computers uh, is that um, you had to gain some level of technical proficiency, even if you wanted to just play games, that most people learned a at least a little bit of basic. And we tried to make that possible uh, as we could by writing better documentation. And that was something that one of the things that I really wanted to accomplish in my uh, minimum of a year at Commodore was improving the documentation because working in the computer store in 78 and experiencing Commodore and other computers after that, 
the the documentation was really really poor. Um, I used to tell people it was like somebody wrote a book about trees and forgot to tell you that they combined together to make a forest. You know, you would learn a lot about a little de little details, but not really learn how to put it all together. So. My first assignment at Commodore was to write the VIC-20 user manual or rewrite it because an outside company had been contracted to write it and it was not sufficient, we thought, uh, to really teach people how to use the computer. So I rewrote the manual and made sure, and I had taught basic programming in computer stores in those few years in between my first computer store job and working at Commodore. So. Uh, I had a pretty fair idea of what uh, of what order to put things in and made sure that we wrote the VIC-20 user manual in a fashion that if someone was really interested in learning to program, it would get them to the point where they could do pretty much anything they needed to with the computer. Was it a challenge to keep the system at a very kind of low cost and how did you achieve this? Well, um, that's Jack Tramiel's specialty. He was all about keeping costs low. Um, Basically, his rule of thumb was the retail price of a unit would be triple the cost. Uh, so uh, if it costs $100 to make the unit, that would be uh, $100 of profit for him and another $100 of profit for the dealer. So the dealer would make $100 and the com company would make 100 and the 100 would go to the manufacturing cost. So there's a $300 computer. Um, but he was also very passionate about as you built uh, scale uh, in your factory, as you got to build more and more units, the cost of building each unit came down and he made sure he kept that three to one rule and passed it along to the customer. So the VIC-20, which started at 295, and I'm sorry, I think I might've said 595 at the beginning, but that was the 64. The VIC-20 started at 295 in the US and came down to $99 or so by the time it was at the end of its lifespan. And that was because Jack was a very tough negotiator for any parts he had to buy outside and uh, and very rigorous about keep getting his engineers to uh, do whatever they could to lower cost of manufacturing as they went forward. And I guess Commodore having their own um, chip fab in MOS technology must have helped as well. Well, absolutely helped in multiple ways. One is that you were designing your own custom chips and not just buying them from elsewhere. Uh, and also because you own the fab and you could improve the yield rates and do all the manufacturing and engineering work in order to get those costs down. But uh, And that came about because in previous years, uh, when Commodore was primarily in the calculator business, they were buying their calculator chips externally, primarily from Texas Instruments. And as the market got bigger and bigger, Texas Instruments decided that they really wanted to own the market. So they came out with their own line of calculators that were selling at retail for about a tenth of what they were charging other companies for their chips. So they very nearly put Commodore out of business and put a lot of other companies out of business. So... Jack at that point decided that he needed to be vertically integrated and be master of his own fate. And that's when he acquired MOS Technologies. Well, we did touch on the, the games on the VIC-20 before. And I know the Commodore did some ports of um, well-known arcade games, but obviously with, uh, with slightly different names. I mean, was, was that for like licensing reasons? And did they ever get into trouble for these like, you know, kind of clones? Well, absolutely. So first of all, um, a lot of those were uh, developed in Japan, either by Commodore Japan or by HAL Labs under license to Commodore. But most of the cases, Commodore Japan had the rights to use those arcade titles uh, like Pac-Man, but uh, those rights were not available in the United States. They, were, they belonged to companies like Atari. Uh, so uh, when Tony Tokai, the head of Commodore Japan would come to the US, he'd bring a bag of, uh, of basically blank cartridges with little sticky tapes on them with the name. And we'd look at them and we'd go, uh, you know, look, it's Pac-Man, it's uh, Rally X and many other titles. And they were generally perfect ports. Uh, but if we didn't have the rights, what were we to do? And what we ended up doing was modifying the games, usually pretty superficially, changing a little bit of the graphics and sound uh, but keeping most of the play action uh, faithful to the arcade game. And that's where we came out with Jelly Monsters and where we came out with uh, Radar Rat Race, which was actually Rally X. And uh, it wasn't the most popular game in the arcade, but it was super fun and it was popular on the VIC-20. Well, also, uh, I remember Scott Adams was uh, pretty prominent on the VIC-20. Well, I was a big Scott Adams adventure fan from the Apple II days, from selling Apple IIs in a retail store. And several of our colleagues on the VIC-20 team were also fans and loved the adventure games. So 
we approached Scott Adams and uh, I guess Mike Tomchak, our boss, uh, negotiated the deal after we lobbied for those games. Um, and then the challenge was those games were 24K of source code and our cartridges only held 16K. So my, my very good old friend, Andy Finkel, who was uh, at Commodore for many, many years, uh, who joined a few weeks after I joined, after he called me and said, uh, what's happening? And I said, get over here right away. Anyway, he went down to Florida where Scott Adams was based and uh, compressed the code so that it ran in a 16K cartridge. It was actually a small miracle. And uh, we ended up with five of the first five Scott Adams adventure games on cartridges for the VIC-20. And the funny thing was, we knew the games were great and super fun, but they were text adventure games. They had no graphics at all. They were just words on the screen that would describe the scene to you and you would type in a two word command telling uh, telling the program what you wanted to do, like uh, uh, get the get the key or whatever it was that you were trying to do. Um, the, the sales guys just were baffled and thought we were out of our minds. But of course, over the course of the first year that those, that those games were out, they were the, the, all five of the num the five top five sellers on the VIC-20. It was like the Beatles coming out with the top five hit, hits on the charts. It was unheard of, but we had great faith in them because it was all about fun and they were just fun games and they were intellectually challenging and they were a great fit for our market. Plus, we knew they had been hugely successful on the Apple II and other computers, but we knew our people had never seen them before because they didn't, you know, if they had an Apple II, they weren't going to buy a VIC-20. I mean, the VIC hardware was, you know, capable for the time as well. I mean, you talked about, you know, graphics and stuff before we mentioned. I mean, what were some of the most impressive things you saw on the VIC-20, you know, be that programs or games or anything like that? Was there, was there anything that stuck in your mind? The thing about the VIC-20 was its internal RAM was very limited. There was only 5K of RAM, of which only 3.5K was available. So unlike the 64, which came later, you couldn't really load games from a disk uh, and expect them to really give you any great performance because memory was so limited. Uh, but the cartridges, as I said, could hold 16K and that was mostly machine code. And back then, programmers learned very carefully how to make every byte count and make every processor cycle count. So they were able to do uh, great things. So uh, games like Lunar Lander and uh, uh, some of the ones I'd already mentioned were really letter perfect ports from the arcade that looked terrific. And uh, and were lots of fun, but you know the really spectacular graphics things came later, came with the C sixty four and computers beyond that. Who were the main competitors at the time, and how did you combat them? Well, so I'm going to give you the U S. perspective because I know the U K. market uh, was somewhat different. In the United States, the primary competitors were Atari with the four hundred and eight hundred computers, uh, the uh, Tandy Radio Shack, and uh, Radio Shack had their own stores. Uh, and were selling their own model of computer, and then Texas Instruments with their 99-4 uh, computer system. And how did Commodore like view the, the Atari 400-900, for example? Well, so we viewed the, well, first of all, the 400 had a membrane keyboard. In other words, it was completely flat, and you had to press carefully if you wanted to hit the correct key. We thought that was a huge mistake in the marketplace, and Commodore had, on the PET, had a non-standard keyboard and learned the lesson from that. The 800 was a terrific computer, and I had worked with it quite a bit in retail stores. The problem was it was over-engineered to the point where it was very robust. It was built basically like a tank, but it, there was no way that um, cost-wise it was going to be competitive with the, uh, with the Commodore computers. So we felt we had a real advantage and that that was our real competition. They had some great software, Atari being the leader at the time in the video game business for the home and for the arcade. Uh, they had some great... Uh, intellectual property to make available, um, but we felt that the market was very price sensitive. Um, now, when you come to Radio Shack um, and also Texas Instruments, my personal feeling at least was that they, they were much less capable computers. Um, Radio Shack was primarily being marketed as a business machine, more like a pet, where it was much less about the graphics and much more about productivity, but it was still very early and it was hard to get serious productivity out of a machine of that era. Um, Texas Instruments, their bi biggest issue in my opinion was that it was a closed system where Texas Instruments wanted to be the sole source for any software for the computer. So all the commercially available software came from Texas Instruments on a cartridge. And frankly, it was a formula for failure because they weren't that great at 
developing software. And there were so many independent companies that sprang up around Commodore and Atari uh, to develop software for them. So our job was to open up the system and write enough documentation, which primarily was the VIC-20 programmer's reference guide, to make sure that people could get all the performance and access all the features in the machine. Uh, and our, our, our secret sauce was we wanted them to create great software because we didn't think we could create all the great software that the computer really needed to be competitive. Now, I don't think Jack Trammell would have gone along with that had we told him. So we were a commando team in the VIC-20 launch team. We did things that weren't necessarily by the book, or a lot of times we did things knowing that if we'd asked permission, we'd probably be told no. Uh, and it's, you know, the, the old saying is it's sometimes easier to beg forgiveness than ask permission. <laughs> yeah. uh, getting the VIC-20 user manuals out uh, with all the documentation and all the schematics that made Developing third-party software and hardware possible was a huge win, I think, for the system at the time. Well, talking about you know how mainstream the VIC-20 was, and you know the the, the audience you were going for. I mean, you had uh, very high-priced TV advertising with William Shatner, um, of course, who everyone knew from Star Trek, um, doing the advertising for the VIC-20. What was William like to work with, and how did you get him involved in the campaign? Um, well, so it was, uh, look, I'm a huge Trekkie. I was watching the original Star Trek back in the 60s, and I really was a big fan. So to me, it was a huge thrill, although I thought it was ironic that the guy uh, uh, who operated the computers on Star Trek was not our spokesman. We had the guy who used to confuse the computers. <laughs> uh, uh, that was much more of a Captain Kirk thing. But, um, you know, it was at the point where uh, I think his career wasn't at a great place. He had been Captain Kirk in the 60s and was somewhat typecast. He hadn't gone on to better parts yet. That came a little bit later. Um, so he was available at a reasonable price, and our ad agency thought that he might be a good spokesman given the science fiction uh, connotation of him. So uh, Commodore was able to get him on board, and he did a number of, uh, a number of things for us. He created a uh, a dealer demo tape that uh, was done with one of my colleagues uh, that was about 30 minutes long. And then he did several different batches of computers. And I was asked to go up to New York City and uh, work the computer for William Shatner on the TV show, so on the TV commercials. So I was thrilled. I was absolutely fanboy gaga over getting to work with Captain Kirk. Um, he was a little bit leery of some of the Star Trek stuff sticking to him. In fact, uh, the first thing that the ad agency did was buy him a velour sweater that looked very much like a Starfleet uniform uh, for him to wear on the commercial, and he absolutely vetoed that. He was not going to wear that on camera, period. He wasn't signed up to be Captain Kirk on our commercials. He was signed up to be William Shatner. Um, so he was a little bit cranky over that, but other than that, he was... Uh, he, he put on a good performance and did a, a good job of, uh, you know, being sincere and, and getting the message across for the computer, and the, which is exactly what we needed. Um, it was Commodore had not been a strong marketing company before. It had been re relatively small. I think Commodore had done $50 million in total revenue uh, the year before I joined the company. And that was mostly in Europe and hardly any in, the, in a, where I was in the U.S., um, so the VIC-20 had just started doing enough business where the company was willing to go out and spend the money on creating these commercials and running them on television. And it was just an upward spiral at that point. Uh, the more we did, the better things got. Well, it became the first computer to sell a million units. So uh, that must have been a huge landmark. What was it like when you guys kind of hit that? Uh, it, was a, it was quite a party, honestly. It was really uh, uh, a huge moment for us. But it was... It wasn't unexpected. We just saw it coming as as we went every step of the way. Things just got bigger and bigger and better and better. Every kind of every trade show that we went to, uh, at that time we used to do three really large trade shows a year in the U.S. Uh, Comdex and uh, con two computer electronic show, consumer electronic shows, one in Chicago and one in Las Vegas. And the crowds just kept getting bigger and bigger. The the there were more and more dealers and resellers, and then. Uh, as we got into the second year of the VIC-20, we started opening up the bigger s stores. So instead of just selling in mom and pop computer stores, we were selling in the large department stores all over the country, one by one. Kmart was the first, uh, but then we had Sears and Montgomery Ward and many regional chains, uh, and it just got got bigger and bigger. So the, 
you were watching the snowball roll downhill from a ringside seat, basically. I think I mixed up the metaphors, but you get the idea. It was, it was, we were very proud of the fact that we had shepherded this new computer system to, the, to be the first to sell a million, but we all, at least my group, totally believed that it would happen right from the beginning. So we weren't surprised or amazed. We were just happy that we got there. Well, one other really visionary thing about the, the VIC-20 and you know, your team as well was the VIC modem. Um, I mean, were you much of an online user yourself and did you already see a future in being online for the mainstream customer even back then? So remember, I told you that my first interaction with a computer in high school was that there was a computer downtown. So we had a teletype and a modem in the high school and the computer was downtown. So I totally got it right from day one. And in the computer stores where I worked, uh, one of the things we sold was access to the main online services of the day, which were uh, source telecomputing, uh, the CompuServe, which was turned out to be the biggest player of that early era, uh, and several um, more business-oriented services. So I was very uh, comfortable with going online, mostly for information uh, services and less for socializing, but I thought it was a, a very important element. And uh, several other members of the team, including Andy, were of the same mindset. So uh, we had talked to our boss, to Mike Tomchek, about it, and Mike looked around for vendors to uh, build us our first modem and uh, felt that the price points were coming in too high. He didn't think that a two or $300 modem for a $300 computer was really something that was marketable. Um, so he determined that the price point had to be under $100 US and uh, went around looking for vendors and clever ideas. And the clever idea that cost reduced it down to the right price point turned out to be that the modem couldn't actually dial the phone itself. Taking out that dialing circuit saved a lot of money. And what you did was, um, now telephones looked a lot different back then. They didn't look like iPhones or, uh, or Android phones. Um, for those of us who are older or those of you who have seen old movies, there was a box with a dial on it and uh, a curled up cable that went into your handset. And so normally you would unplug the, the, the telephone from the wall and plug that into your modem, and then the modem would dial the number. In the VIC modem, you would actually unplug the handset and dial the phone yourself, but the handset would be plugged into the modem, and that saved a bunch of circuitry and was able to get that price under $100. So that product was completely created uh, out of a vision within our, our VIC-20 commando group with the hard work of Michael Tomchek and the Jack Trammell's philosophy of it, 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 of making sure that products come in at a price people can actually afford. And the modem became a huge seller for us. It was also a, a, a gigantic success. When the VIC modem was first being created and we needed to sell it to uh, the distribution channel, uh, it only existed as a, as a single board without a case or anything like that. And uh, if you remember the way things like that plugged into the computer, there were an edge connector and uh, the device had a little tab on it so you could plug it in only in one direction, not the other direction. But the prototype Vic modem I had had no edge connector on it. Um, so I was at, out with our vice president of sales making a call on one of the largest toy chains in the country. And I was sitting in the lobby and I like to be prepared. And so I set up the computer and uh, plugged in the modem to test it out. And the light on the computer went out, meaning that I had just blown the fuse. And I went, uh-oh, that's not a good thing. The, as soon as I plugged the modem in, the fuse blew. So I found a telephone and called the office and talked to the engineers and said, look, if I plug this in upside down, is it likely to blow the fuse? Because I don't have a spare fuse, but I could plug in a few, some coins from my pocket into the fuse spot. Uh, but if the computer has gone bad, I might burn down the building. <laughs> So you need to tell me. And they thought about it and they said, yeah, if you plug it in upside down, it will probably blow the fuse. So I put in a few quarters from my pocket, uh, turned the modem upside down, plugged it in and crossed my fingers. And sure enough, it worked fine. So we did the demo and we didn't burn down the toy company. And uh, <laughs> that's how we got the VIC-20 uh, VIC modem out the door in that partic particular company. But, you know, those days, it was the Wild West. We were making stuff up as we went along and you never knew if something was going to work or not work. So uh, fortunately, uh, you know, fortunately, that one uh, went the way it's supposed to work. 
You also became editor of the Commodore magazine. How did this come about? So year one was my experience uh, in the VIC-20 commando team, and that was 1981. And at the end of 1981, as things started getting bigger, uh, it was requested by our vice president of dealer sales that uh, he needed some help. And he pointed at me and said, you know, I had already been going out and helping the sales guys in my spare time being Again, someone who had enough sales experience where I could speak to non-technical people and explain the computer. And the fact that I loved it, the computer so much you know, came across in that conversation. So I ended up as part of that group for my second year during 1982. Um, in between road trips, I was writing manuals and the occasional article. But at the end of the year, I was like tired of being on the road that much. Um, I wasn't a sales guy. I was basically what these days we call a sales engineer. And it was going well, but I didn't feel like I was really progressing and it, I w wasn't contributing as much as I was able to contribute. And at that point, the person who was running Commodore Magazine left the company. And Commodore Magazine for its first year under this other person was more of a promotional magazine. I don't know why anybody would have paid for it because it was just articles about how wonderful Commodore was and how great its executives were. And it was just really publicity for the, for the company and not something a user would uh, would get a lot of value out of. Whereas the, out on the newsstand, you could go buy Creative Computing and Byte Magazine and many other publications that were much more informative about what was really going on. Uh, so I approached the vice president of marketing, Kit Spencer, uh, who was the guy who really ran the whole marketing team over the second year and uh, managed all those great commercials and managed the growth of the company uh, in the marketing side and said, look, Kit, I've done some publishing before, which was a bit of a stretch because I'd been involved in some science fiction club magazines and things like that, but nothing at any scale. And I said, this magazine could be so much better and I could turn it into a profitable business instead of something that you're, that's costing you half a million dollars a year to send out that nobody really reads. And I said, and frankly, I'm tired of going out on the road all the time, but if the sales guys need me, I'm sure I could make myself available from time to time. But in the meantime, I'd love to have the chance to show you what I can do with a, with a department of my own. And the miracle was he said, okay, and gave me a shot. And I took over Commodore and PowerPlay magazines and turned them into successful newsstand magazines. Each one here in the US was at about 100,000 copies of an issue that were sold. Uh, Commodore Magazine came out six times a year. Power Play, which was more game and fun oriented, was uh, four times a year. And we built up a department and uh, that went very well. And in the meantime, they threw a couple of other projects my way uh, uh, because basically I became in charge of orphans. Um, there was a mail order project where they hired somebody from a mail order catalog company who created a catalog full of VIC-20 accessory gear, mailed it out, and then quit the company before the first order came in. So they asked me to take that over. They said, it's kind of like a magazine. And then uh, we started the Commodore Information Network, which ran on the CompuServe online service. Um, they, Sig Hartman, who was the vice president of our software division, spent six months negotiating the deal and then realized that somebody had to actually operate this day to day. So uh, he asked me if I would do that, and I said, sure, and I ended up being in charge of online services as well. It sounds like you were pretty busy during that time, but I mean, you know, we, we're talking about the VIC-20, and it had its, its, its moment in the sunshine. Actually, when you look back, was pretty brief because, you know, the Commodore 64 came along um, only a couple of years later and kind of, you know, stole its thunder in a way, I guess you could say. I mean, did you do much work on the Commodore 64? Yes, I was part of the, Vic, the Commodore 64 launch team as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, and yeah, I mean, basically, once this Commodore 64 came out, uh, you could tell that the VIC-20's days were numbered. The VIC-20 was very successful and sold a few million units, but the Commodore 64 sold, I think, 24 million, was, and to this day is the best-selling computer model of all time. Um, but it was just a smooth transition. Most of the people that were involved in the VIC-20 were involved in the Commodore 64. There were just a lot more of us because the company was so much bigger at the time. Well, things changed massively um, in 1984 when Jack left Commodore. Do you know the reasons why? And I, were you actually there at that last CES show that you attended? I was at the show, and it was kind of shocking that um, Jack Trammell got up in front of a whole room full of people. I mean, he was speaking in a room that had to hold several thousand people at that conference because Commodore, and he announced that Commodore was the first computer 
a home computer company to cross a billion dollars in revenue, and that was huge. Um, and I was standing in the back of the room watching, and I thought, this is amazing, but why doesn't he look happy? And apparently at a board of directors meeting several days before, uh, there was some falling out between Jack and the chairman and possibly the rest of the board. Nobody really is telling the exact story of what ha transpired, but uh, very shortly after the CES, Jack Tremell announced that he was leaving the company. And it was a very, very different place after that. So that was in January of 1984. And it was like the air went out of the room. There was no energy left. And you were talking about how it seemed like I was very busy. I liked being busy. It was really stimulating and there was no shortage of things to do and no shortage of growth opportunities for somebody that was reasonably competent and uh, willing to work hard. Um, a few months after Jack left, at one point I came to my boss and said, look, there's nothing going on here. I don't have anything to do. What should I be doing? He said, don't worry about it. Just put your head down and look busy. And I, that wasn't the company I signed up to work for. It was a very, very different place. Plus, not only was there not much energy and not much activity going on, but um, the people that were brought in at that point to run the company didn't get it. Jack got it. Jack was not a technical guy, but he understood what people wanted. And most of the people that were uh, senior and mid-level executives understood computers and what people wanted from them. You know, They weren't necessarily engineers, but they understood the marketplace. The next group of executives that were brought in were brought in from outside, from uh, different kinds of companies, from industrial companies and so on, and really had no idea. Didn't understand that Commodore was made successful by providing high quality at very low prices. The, the cost imperative went away and they just made one mistake after another. So very quickly, I saw the, the, the handwriting on the wall, so to speak, and so thought, this is not a place that's gonna work out in the long term, I wanna be somewhere else. So it was fortunately for me, uh, I was kind of in the in crowd, and a lot of people who left uh, the company went to work for Jack Tremell at Atari, and the word came back to me that uh, people like me would be welcome if we were interested in moving out to the West Coast. So that was my next step. Well, let's get into the um, the Atari era then. So like you said, Jack, you know, he left Commodore, then he bought Atari. Um, and you made the move over there as well. I mean, what you, were you initially working on when you got to Atari? So the excuse they used to bring me to Atari was that they had a, a magazine that uh, Atari had, had run uh, much like Commodore was much more uh, like a, a publicity vehicle at first, uh, but they had sold a lot of subscriptions and uh, either they had to publish a magazine or they had to give a whole bunch of people their money back. And now giving people their money back was not Jack Tramiel's style. Uh, so when I called and I talked to Greg Pratt, who was one of my bosses at Commodore, who was a, a vice president of operations and was now the chief operating officer at Atari. He said, we have these, this magazine, we need somebody to run it. We'd, you know, we'd love to have you out. Why don't you fly out and talk to us? And again, the basic role was the excuse was running the magazines, but they needed people to, to do writing. Uh, they needed people to go around with the sales guys and all the things that I used to do in my voluminous spare time. So was it kind of a challenge going from that old Atari to the new company with Jack? It was a huge challenge because the company was falling apart as we were brought in, and it continued to fall apart for some months after the new team came on board. So Commodore, I mean, sorry, Atari had peaked at about $2 billion U.S. in revenue in, the, in its last year under Warner Brothers, who was the owner of the company at the time. Uh, but they spent $3 billion that same year, so they lost a $1 billion, which again in the, in the 80s before inflation was a huge amount of money for a corporation and nearly took the entire Warner Brothers empire down with them. Um, so basically Warner Brothers started pulling the plugs on allowing them to spend money and the company went into a, a free fall. By the time we got there, there was almost no revenue. Nothing was being sold. There were warehouses full of old stuff. Um, I, and. The, the Tremel group came on board a few months before I joined them and started laying people off. And they would lay off after layoff after layoff and just trying to figure out how to stem the tide, how to jumpstart sales of some of the older products like home video game machines and the 400, 800. 
And in the meantime, they had already, before they bought the company, started working on the new Atari ST computer line uh, under development. And so trying to figure out how to get all those things going at the same time was was an enormous challenge. And there was no no way to know if we were going to succeed. So I joined the company in August of 84. And in January of 85, we launched the Atari, announced the Atari ST and as well as the revamped 8-bit computers, uh, the XE uh, line, which were based on the uh, the 400 and 800 XL. And I'll tell you a story. The, the Atari ST uh, was built from the ground up in the course of about nine months, which is a remarkable time span, with a number of custom chips uh, based on the uh, uh, Motorola 68000 chip, which was also in the, uh, Apple, the Apple Mac at the time. But there was a lot of custom hardware in it to keep the cost down and, and make it work properly. Several of those chips uh, made their first appearance at the Consumer Electronics Show in January of 1985. And had came come straight from the fab uh, and had never been tested before. So they were plugged into the motherboard and we all crossed our fingers and hoped that it would actually work because it was kind of life and death for us. And it was a miracle. There were two new custom chips that made their first appearance at that show and they both worked the first try and the computer worked and we were able to demonstrate it. And that was the start of the real revival of uh, the, of what we called the new Atari. Well, I've read before that, you know, um, some people theorize that the reason that Jack bought Atari was to kind of get back at Commodore and destroy them. I mean, did you kind of see any of that? And was, was he kind of bitter about what happened? Uh, you know, it's an interesting story. I'm not sure how true it is. I think uh, that it's much more likely that uh, that uh, Warner Brothers approached Jack and said, look, we know you're available. We've got this company. It's got a brand name and assets and distribution. And uh, Jack realized he could get it for a really good price. I mean, the total price of, for Atari at that point ended up being $24 million. That was uh, a tiny drop in a, uh, compared to what the company had been worth just two years before. So whether there was some opportunity for uh, competition uh, with his former company and with a rivalry, I'm, I'm guessing that was some of it, but I'm sure that wasn't the primary driver. I think the, Jack's primary driver was could he leverage this in order to be successful and make money. What were the aims and beginnings of the ST project? Well, the ST was, the, was uh, meant to be the next generation home computer after the VIC-20 and C64, it was a 16-bit computer with a graphical user interface. So instead of the ready prompt and start typing in basic, now you had a, a graphical user interface that you could use for apps, uh, much like what we're used to today with, uh, with uh, Apple and Windows computers. So it was really the very beginning of that. Uh, Apple had a Mac, but there wasn't really much else out that could work with that ease of use at the time. But again, it was a lot of people called it the Jackintosh at that point. It was designed to be a much lower price point for a highly capable computer. Yeah, and the operating system, that gem operating system, was you know looked quite similar to the Mac OS, didn't it? Yes, it was developed uh, in collaboration between the Atari engineering team and uh, Digital Research, um, which uh, and so yes, it was meant to be uh, Mac-like. It was felt by the group that was doing the uh, software development, headed by Leonard Trammell, Jack's uh, middle son, uh, that that, w that form of point and click was the wave of the future. And I think that was proven out to be true because we're still doing it today. But were you aware of the, um, the Amiga at the time? Because obviously I know the ST beat it to market. I mean, was that something that you, you, know, you, you prepared to take on? Was it in, in the background? Were, were you aware of it? Uh, I think everyone was aware of it. In fact, when I was at Commodore toward the end, uh, Commodore was working on acquiring the uh, the Amiga product and team, um, and I I wasn't really exposed to it because I think I was in that list of people that they felt were Jack people and were probably on the way out the door. So I wasn't really given access. I know several other people who ended up at Atari also had had trouble getting their hands on the Amiga, but uh, yeah, it was very clear that uh, that the Amiga was coming and Commodore had a lot of resources and that that was going to be a primary comp competitor in our core market, which was the lower cost version of, uh, of a computer like an, a Mac. Well, how did you prepare to take it on? Uh, it was just a matter of, you know, how much software can we get built for it and how many dealers can we sign up uh, and uh, how much could we keep the cost down in order to be competitive? Well, when I was checking out, you know, some of the stuff that you wrote, 
um, in magazines back in the day before we we spoke this evening. Um, I loved one article I came across called um, ST1999. Thank you, you. I was very proud of that one. That was a really good read. And actually, it was um, you, you had a prediction in there about what computing would be like in the 21st century. And actually, you, you did get a lot right in the article, I, didn't you? I, it's one of the reasons I'm proud of it. So that was actually my swan song. I actually wrote that just after I left the company. I left... Uh, uh, I left Atari in uh, uh, 1988 after almost exactly four years at the company and went to work for an online service called Genie that was part of General Electric. Uh, and uh, I wanted to write something as a farewell to the marketplace because I had been you know, intimately acquainted with the people who were Atari users. Um, I was the head of user support and head of online support. I was out um, almost every weekend year round at various user group fairs and things like that. So I just wanted to send out a little message and you know, have a chance to really think about where things might be going as we went forward. I'll put a link in our show notes if people want to read that article. But I mean, some of the predictions you made in there just it did actually come true. The only thing is that it didn't happen on an Atari ST, unfortunately, did it? Yeah, that was, <laughs> there was that part of it. But yeah, I mean, you know, I'm a science fiction fan. And I like to think about what's coming in the future and what the implications might be. And I felt very strongly. And I, I had actually given a talk at a computer conference that uh, uh, Byte Magazine actually beat me up about, where I talked about the fact that I thought that some things that were being done in businesses that made your life easier, were difficult on today's versions of home computers and would be easier as we went forward. For example, um, if you write a, uh, if you have a list of people's names and addresses, you get a bunch of business cards. And at that point in a business, you would hand the pile to your secretary and your secretary would type them all into the computer for you and you would have them online when you, when you needed them. For an average home computer user, that was just, you know, uh, too much like work. Hmm. Uh, and I felt that, uh, that scanning and uh, optical character recognition was right around the corner and that would make life a lot easier. And today I can take my iPhone, take a picture of a business card and have it end up zapped right into my, uh, into my contact list. So that was the kind of thing where you just think about what was difficult. Um, keeping your checkbook, that was always a cliche in the very early days of one of the things you would do with your computer, but it was a giant pain uh, to type all that information and it was very repetitive. And then Quicken came along and made it uh, automatic where once you would type something in, it could pop up very quickly the next time around. So those sorts of things, those sorts of innovations uh, were what you could see coming. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a shame that Atari didn't do it, but uh, those, the, the technology was moving in that direction. I love the line you finished the article with. If it all sounds too far-fetched, remember, so was that computer on your desk not too long ago. <laughs> well, yeah, and a lot of it was, um, you know, uh, the goal uh, the goal in the computer industry has always been to make computers that work like they do on Star Trek. Uh, and yeah. now we have them, right? In Star <laughs> Trek, you could talk to the computer instead of typing at it. And now we've all got Alexa and Siri and all those other things. Uh, and, you know, the communicator was the big innovation in Star Trek. And now we've all got communicators in our pockets and so forth. So. Um, to some extent, you can still think about what they haven't delivered yet from Star Trek and figure out what it's going to take to make that happen. We just need those know, doors. I don't know about transporters. That's the tough <laughs> one. But everything else is uh, hopefully coming soon. We, we just need those sliding doors. Those, those are fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Well, the real trick on that show were there, there were guys in the back of those doors that slid them open and closed for you. But, yeah, that would be pretty good. <laughs> you have to hire people, Ravi, to do it, Ronnie. Right? <laughs> you know, if you've got some money, you can hire people to open the door for you, I guess. But William Shatner could. He could. <laughs> well, Neil, what are you doing these days? What, what's kind of your job and your career today? So, uh, let's see. We, we, I took you up to the point where I went to work for Genie. I stayed there for five years. Um, and I actually, I had uh, early in my career, I had dropped out of college and went to work as a programmer. So while I was at GE, I went back and got my undergraduate degree in business. And uh, fairly soon after that, uh, joined a video game company called Simutronics that made online games like Gemstone and Dragon Realms and CyberStrike. And stayed with that company for almost 20 years, left in 2012. Uh, we did very nicely over that time period. And since then, I've been mostly... Um, uh, in my day job, working in the IT industry, running projects, helping startups, and so forth. And uh, I'm also an elected official. I ran for city council uh, here in Gaithersburg, right outside of Washington, D.C., uh, and I've been on the city council since 2014. In fact, I'm up for re-election this November. So uh, hopefully we'll continue for another four years, but uh, we'll see what the voters have to say. 
still like being busy. I do like being busy, and my wife likes keeping me busy too. Well, Neil, it's been a great little walk down uh, memory lane and getting these inside stories on, you know, such, such legendary companies that, you know, shaped Ravi and I's childhood. You know, it's, it's been wonderful talking to you. So thank you so much for being our guest this week. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I appreciate it. It's always fun to go back on back down memory lane.